Hey there, it's me, Andrew Austin of the FAR podcast, Freedom and Reason, associated with the Freedom and Reason blog. And this is not an episode, just an announcement uh, that I have a uh, entry that I've just posted in the Freedom and Reason blog. And today is, um, boy, this lockdown. Um, do you start to lose track of the days? It's uh, This is May 16th, and I'm talking to you at 524 p.m. about to go out and cook some steaks uh, because uh, I'm a carnivore and it's how I deal with um, uh, with my health, uh, you know, how I improve my health. Uh, the, the, the title of the entry is The J-Curve Theory of Revolution, James C. Davies' Great Insight, and the, it starts off with a picture of the American Sociological Review masthead, and then this was published February 1962, Towards a Theory of Revolution by James C. Davies of the California Institute of Technology. Now, February 1962 is an interesting uh, month and year. Um, in March, and of course Davies had written this before it was published in February, um, but in any case, uh, so it comes out, and my, uh, my father at the time is a preacher, and preaching in uh, Roger Springs, Tennessee. And my mother uh, is carrying me in uh, her womb. I, I would be born March 11th, 1962. So this article comes out a month before I'm born. Now, was that significant? No, it's not really significant. It's just interesting. And, you know, it makes me think about what was the world like when I was born. And there's a lot of interesting things that are coming out in the late 50s and early 60s um, in, in sociology. Another period that's very interesting in sociology is in the late 30s. Uh, I mean, you know, Frank uh, Tannenbaum's uh, dr dramatization of evil thesis, Edwin Sutherland's differential association thesis, um, Robert Merton's Social structure and anatomy thesis. Uh, it, you know, it was it was a it was an interesting year. So, uh, or interesting, you know, a couple of years. That that's at 38, 39. and nineteen sixties uh, and sixty two. Here's interesting. And another really, I mean, Irving Goffman's work was coming out at this time. Uh, David Monza and Gresham Sykes. A neutralization theory. Uh, this is in the early '60s, late '50s. Uh, uh, just, just, uh, and the kind of things that you are reading that get published at this time, which are theory pieces and think pieces, uh, get replaced over time in sociology with with a lot of statistical stuff that isn't really that relevant. And Baron Sweezy, um, uh, and uh, in Monopoly Capital. Um, I say it's not Baron Sweezy and the person's name is Baron and Sweezy, Sweezy and Baron. Um, in, in their in their preface, it's very fascinating where they talk about the way in which knowledge is being um, fragmented uh, by the bureaucratic specialization, you know, progressive bureaucratic specialization. And I want to tell you, I have uh, also recently posted a blog entry that deals with that, the problem of that, and the theme is with Eisenhower. And the military industrial complex and the science uh, industrial complex, and I uh, riff on that. And in, in light of the problems we're seeing now with the medical industrial complex, uh, and you know the corporate control over science, and I'll be doing a, a the next episode of the Far Podcast will be dealing with that subject. I want to talk about C. Wright Mills. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Zygmunt Bauman's you know, notion of modernity and, and uh, the Holocaust. It, it's going to be a very serious uh, podcast, uh, and a little bit, but but a little bit of of sort of thinking about what we can do politically. Uh, I'll be talking about Richard Grossman as well, and the difference between progressivism, which is fully embedded in corporatism and uh, in the corporate logic. Um, and is, lies at the core of so many of the problems we're facing uh, versus uh, populism, which is a small-D democratic you know, local control 
um, and, and which is focused on you know the sovereign, the importance of rec- of, of respecting the sovereign people and individual liberty and all of those things. Uh, and science, uh, science is science. It you know it works. Um, it can work in a progressive regime and it can work in a populist regime. The question is, do we want technocratic science or we do, or do we want um, democratic science? Democratic science isn't you get to vote on the truth. That's not what that means. A democratic science is science which is in the service of uh, of the betterment of humanity in a democratic society. Anyway, so I just wanted to direct your attention to that, uh, towards a theory of revolution by James C. Davies. It's, it's, I have been teaching the the J, what's called the J curve thesis in my classes. Uh, maybe a little embarrassed to say this, it, it it just seemed intuitive to me, and I just said, you know, if you actually look at the patterns in history, what you'll find is is that people don't revolt. People always say, well, when will conditions be bad enough for people to revolt? And the answer to that is, yeah, powerless people don't have a lot of power. Uh, and in fact, um, when you, um, it, it's, 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 it's no politics at all to just hope that the world spins into chaos and that somehow out of that's going to become the revolt. First of all, you know, the rebellions that, that do occur, as I explain, you know, Marx and Engels point out it's a primitive rebellion essentially is street crime. Uh, and so that's, uh, uh, you know, the people in despair, the result of structural inequality and demoralization, uh, all that does is just um, ha- workers wind up hurting other workers, or, or you know the the lump in proletariat, right? Uh, displaced workers um, turn to crime, and and um, and the, their moral permission is is that the law doesn't work for them. So why do they respect it? They have no stake in conformity. Uh, so that's not any, uh, and I and there's a lesson there with the Black Panthers in the '60s and the way in which they helped the situation and the destruction of the Black Black Panthers at the hands of the FBI and their COINTEL Pro uh, uh, interventions uh, a- actually contributed to the rise of gang violence, so which was tamed significantly by by people in uh, black communities, uh, primarily uh, of black males, young black males having a, an actual political movement to be part of rather than um, a tribal warfare. So I talk, uh, that, that's, that's an important lesson for understanding this. Uh, no, wh- th- then I explain why is it that, that we uh, um, um, then see successful revolutions. It has to do with rising affluence, with expectations and those sorts of things. And that, that's, the, that's the J-curve thesis. So I clearly had read it at some point and incorporated it into my thinking and just went on and I never published anything about it. So I didn't get a reference. Uh, it was just the, you know, in the general, you know, the, you know, the, the, the current of ideas that uh, were washing over me as I was uh, being socialized into the discipline of sociology. And so I was having a conversation with my dad last night. Um, and uh, he all of a sudden starts making this point, and I'm I'm like, wait a second, I that's exactly the point that I teach in class. Uh, and he says, oh, you should check this out. It's you know James C. Davies, um, J Curve Theory of Revolution. And I'm like, oh gosh, well I'm gonna write a gonna write a um, gonna write a, a a blog entry on that that you know that that'll be coming soon. And so this morning I got up and I and I did that. Uh, I kind of floated the idea on Facebook as I as I often do with my blog entries, and so I just wanted to draw your attention to that, and this will be incorporated into sort of thinking about political strategy uh, as we confront the growth of the corporate state, um, uh, as we confront um, uh, bureaucratic uh, scientific oppression. Uh, and try to reclaim uh, science uh, for democracy uh, and um, and realize the, 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 the promise of the enlightenment of, 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 of uh, secular enlightened inquiry into the world around us uh, and push back against the postmodern uh, corruption uh, of, of science um, which is uh, which is used uh, the corporations use it to advance profits so they understand what the truth is but then what gets taught in universities and humanities and social science departments is a very anti-scientific view um, but at the same time uh, the uh, what I'm picking up from a lot of people uh, particularly young people is a, is a is a religious like intensity with respect to science you see this for example when you 
you question not vaccine technology as the, the the understanding of immunology is very poor immunology works on a couple you know the, the, the you know at the highest levels of understanding of immunology it, you know one 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 really needs to have some expertise but um but everybody can understand immunology at its basic level um because it's obvious but what happens is is that you have these corporations which uh, uh so which spread disinformation and so con, um, confusion at the same time create an attitude uh, a very uh, uh, um, uh, uh, it's, the, the zealotry is really intense among those people who this is where you get into the anti-vaxxers right they, they accuse you of, you say well maybe there's a problem with having so many vaccines that are being developed maybe not because they actually contribute to our health um, but because they generate profit for pharmaceutical corporations. Well, you just say that, and you'll be accused of being anti-science, but that's actually very pro-science. We want democratic science. We want, to, we want to decide which vaccines are important based on the interest of the community, not based on the bottom line uh, of corporations. That's, that's, um, um, that, that's an obvious uh, question for anybody who's democratically minded. Uh, and then, of course, the other problem with, a, with the whole vaccine thing is and as well as this lockdown, you'll see with the quarantining of healthy people, which is just bizarre, uh, that, oh, that's but science tells us we should do that. No, science doesn't tell you what you should do. That's a policy question. Uh, just like if I made the argument that we could uh, greatly uh, slow global warming if we you know exterminated half of the world's population, and I could show with models that what the effects would be, and I said, well, it's science. And you'd say that's crazy, right? Because you don't sacrifice, you know, human beings. Or, well, we do want to reduce the population, and but there's a humane way of doing that, and we want to educate people about the impact of of, of the population uh, on the, the planet. But at the same time, uh, if we had to save the planet, nobody would agree that we should exterminate half the world's population. Well, even if the science says that that would be an effective route, I, I, I it's just, it's, it, this is because. We're human beings. Science is a human endeavor. We produce science. And if science isn't being produced for humanity, if it's being produced instead for the bottom line of corporations, we are doing um, – it's not that we're not or doing science or doing science. It's that the science uh, is being used for a really bad reason, and people have to learn how to separate those things. Anyway, I'm digressing because it's just fresh on my mind. Um, what does that have to do with uh, uh, the J-curve theory revolution? Well, what it has to do with is what I said earlier, um, that um, I'm going to be doing a, a podcast on the science scientific industrial complex, right? And that what... Um, this, and this is part of a much larger thesis that I'm developing concerning the role that uh, um, with the fall in the rate of profit and the labor movement and the movement towards democratic socialism in the 1940s and 50s and 60s and the way in which the ruling class organized to disorganize uh, the worker movement uh, in order to restore the fall, uh, restore the rate of profit uh, and 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 separate um, uh, wages and compensation from productivity, uh, and reduce the affluence of the workers so they would have less power to be able to organize in exactly the way that James Davies' uh, thesis suggests. Anyway, so it's it's all all tied together. Uh, I'm going to be closing a lot of loops, uh, but the main thing here is go uh, go read my blog entry. See you later. Andrew Austin, The Far Podcast. Check it out. I got even better episodes coming. By the way, I'm in my uh, upstairs office. Got a new uh, desktop boom stand so I can clean up my space a bit. Running SM58 up here. I have my podcasting base downstairs. But up here, I've got the SM58 running into the Behringer Euphoria UMC22. Um, the, <clears throat> excuse me. That's the interface into the computer. I'm using OBS. Uh, if you haven't, uh, don't don't spend any money uh, on your broadcasting uh, system. Use OBS. It's a beautiful thing. And I will be talking to you again really soon. Peace.